Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome back to the As A Woman podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and today we are talking all about uterine polyps, uterine fibroids, and essentially what I want you to know about the things that could be inside your uterus, how we look for them, how we treat them, when you need intervention, and when you don't. Before we dive in, I just want to say thank you so much for all of your love and support for the As A Woman podcast. I just never stop being amazed at the fact that we have over 3 million downloads. This little podcast that started in my closet in 2019 truly now has just exceeded my expectations. And every time one of you messages me or tells me or stops me in the grocery store or And you tell me how much this podcast meant to you or how one episode really helped you. Just thank you. It means more to me than you will know. Also, I do want you to know that you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter and that's where the fertility in the news segments have gone. In the newsletter, I'm going to keep you up to date on hot topics in the news because this podcast can live on and on, but you know, we want to talk about those hot topics. So go on over to nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter, and you can stay up to date on projects I'm doing, things that I'm launching, that I'm involved in, opportunities to meet me, fertility in the news topics, answering your fertility questions, my favorite recipes, and more. And if you want to ask a question, there are a few different ways to do that. So every week we have a segment, Fertility Q&A, at the end of each podcast episode. So you can ask your questions on Mondays on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. You also can have those questions answered on Instagram or in the newsletter in addition to each podcast episode. And my most favorite podcast episodes to record are the Fertility Q&A episodes. So this is where you call, leave a voicemail with your question, and I get to answer it. You can call six. 657-229-3672. Leave your question. That's a great way to get your question answered. All right, well, let's dive in to talking about the uterus and polyps and fibroids. So the first thing I want everybody to realize when we're talking about the uterus is that developmentally, the uterus starts as two different buds inside the body. And these buds elongate, fuse together, and the midline portion dissolves, leaving what we think of as the triangular shaped uterus. And these buds compose the top one third of the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. And I always just think this is important because you can have birth defects of your uterus and just understanding the uterine structure is really important to understand anything that can go wrong. So first of all, you can be born without a uterus and that's called Mullerian agenesis or Myrokatansi Kusterhauser. M-R-K-H, and this is when you have complete absence of all of those Mullerian structures, meaning you have a blind vaginal pouch, the top one-third of your vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes are all not there. Importantly, the ovaries are a completely different embryological origin, so anything that might interfere with the uterine development has nothing to do with the ovaries. So even in MRKH, you still have ovaries, you still go through the initial stages of puberty, which is all about ovarian activation and estrogen production. So you have breast development, normal secondary sex characteristics, you just never get a period. That's called primary amenorrhea, and that's really how you get diagnosed. You can also have a slew of other issues. And many of these are actually not diagnosed until later in your reproductive years. So you can have absence of an entire half. One whole bud doesn't develop. That's a unicornuate uterus, very often associated with unilateral kidney absence as well. You can have complete separate horns that never fuse, and that's called a uterine didelphus. This can also be associated with a midline septum at the top third of the vagina, and that is considered a longitudinal vaginal septum. And when you have this, this is one of the only ones that might get diagnosed early because pretty classic is 
bleeding around a tampon. You're putting a tampon in, but it only goes to one side of that vaginal septum and one side of the uterus. The other uterus side and the open side is just still bleeding. And you can also have pain or difficulty with intercourse or that septum could tear with intercourse. Then you have a bicornuate, which is partial fusion partial reabsorption of the septum. So you have a classic heart shape with an indention at the top and you have a uterine septum, which I have full episodes on, which is the most common. And it's just failure of that last step, incomplete reabsorption of the midline septum that is avascular and associated with miscarriage. Now that's the only one you really repair with the exception of taking out that vaginal septum and the other abnormalities of the uterus might cause more typically abnormal placentation, increased risk of placenta previa, preterm birth, preterm labor, growth restriction, abnormal presentation because the uterus is abnormally shaped so the baby might not be head down, increasing the incidence that you might have a C-section. So that's how the uterus is formed. And then the uterus has layers. And this is also important in understanding the uterus. The inside part of the uterus is the endometrium. That is what we think of as what you're bleeding. It's what's growing. It's responsive to estrogen and progesterone, prepares itself for implantation, and then sheds. The bulk of the uterus, most of the actual uterine structure is called the myometrium. And this is the muscular component of the uterus. This is what causes your cramps. This is what allows your uterus to expand when you get pregnant. And this is what allows you to have contractions when you go into labor. And then you have the outer portion of the uterus called the serosa. And this is actually silky smooth coating so that nothing sticks to the outside of the uterus. All right, but thinking about the actual structural defects that can contribute potentially to infertility or can be diagnosed or cause problems, we're really gonna dive in and focus on polyps and fibroids today. So a polyp is a projection of that endometrial glands and stroma. So think about it like the inside layer, that endometrium, you have an actual projection into it, like a little ball. And polyps can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. So the typical symptoms of polyps are intermenstrual bleeding, meaning in between your periods, you actually are having spotting or bleeding. So when I see somebody who's having mid-cycle spotting, they might think it's implantation and maybe it is, or maybe it's ovulatory. But in my brain, I also always want to rule out a polyp. We know that polyps are the most common structural abnormality of the uterus. Most polyps are benign, but they can be malignant, especially in people who are not having regular periods. You're increasing the risk that this polypoid projection could actually be cancerous. It's estimated that about 10% of people with a uterus have polyps, but to be honest, we don't have that full number because how many people are asymptomatic, might have a polyp, and have never had any imaging inside your uterus, meaning you've never had an HSG test or a saline sonogram. Regular transvaginal ultrasound does not always diagnose them, but it can sometimes. In infertility patients, we see higher rates. Is this because we're looking inside the uterus and in other people we're not? Or is it because it's actually associated with infertility? Honestly, it's probably a combination of both. The prevalence of having a polyp in people who have undergone IVF is going to be between 11 to 45%. So Studies are obviously showing a huge range here, and this number is really different. If you break it down and you think about people who have recurrent implantation failure or endometriosis, it does look like polyps are more common in these groups for whatever reason. And we do think that polyps are associated with infertility in some way, even if the mechanism may be poorly understood. Some of the different hypotheses, maybe it interferes with sperm actually getting through the uterus. Maybe it impacts embryo implantation through an inflammatory mechanism. That's what most of us think is most common. Further, studies have suggested that the location of the polyp may influence pregnancy rate. So if you had polyps in the places of the uterus where embryos implant, the walls, the lateral walls, then it was more likely that you would not get pregnant with a polyp in place and then have improvement after surgery. And so there probably is some local inflammation or some issue with embryo implantation. And there was also a study looking at people who had infertility and doing a polypectomy did 
did improve rates of getting pregnant afterwards. But really interestingly, there was no difference in that improvement if the polyp was small, less than a centimeter, or if it was big and you had a lot of them, which is interesting because people previously said, oh, a really small polyp, maybe you can just ignore it. But showing that everybody had improvement in that group, regardless of the size or the number of the polyps, would tell us that it might be a more local reaction versus a true obstruction because you would, because if it was truly related to obstructing sperm transport or an actual issue with the precise location where an embryo is trying to implant, you would think more polyps, bigger polyps, worse. So it's probably due, as you know, I'm a big believer in some type of inflammation or something that is actually happening from just the presence of the polyp there. Because polyps are relatively common, especially in infertility patients, and do appear to have an impact on pregnancy rates through proposed mechanism of inflammation with implantation, I am a believer everybody needs to be evaluated to see if they have a polyp, especially if you're doing IVF sometime before you do the embryo transfer. And believe it or not, this is not standard of care. There are definitely practices that I have seen, I've gotten records from, that just do not look. They do not take the time. And why not? I don't know. Blows my mind. But anyways, the way that you can diagnose a uterine polyp because you cannot always see it on vaginal ultrasound is by some type of imaging inside the uterus. And the best two options are going to be a saline sonogram or hysteroscopy. So you can see a filling defect on an HSG, but it doesn't really tell you what it is. So HSG, hysterosalpingogram, that is the x-ray dye test. This is where speculum goes in the vagina, catheter to cervix, and dye gets injected into the uterus and the fallopian tubes while taking an x-ray. It is a very good test to see if the fallopian tubes are open. For the inside of the uterus though, the dye is just filling the uterus. And so it can tell you, does it look normal or does it look like there's a filling defect or an area where the dye is not going? It's not the world's best test for the inside of the uterus because you're getting a flat picture of something that's three-dimensional, but it typically will pick up most abnormalities. Better test, saline sonogram, and hysteroscopy. Your clinic may do one or the other, and honestly, they're both very good in trained hands. Saline sonogram, an SIS, saline infused sonogram, hysterosonogram, all the same thing. This is where, very similar to an HSG, a speculum is placed in the vagina, a catheter goes to the cervix, and saline or water is put into the uterus while you watch with vaginal ultrasound. Volume is much less than an HSG, so if you had a very painful HSG, please don't worry, this is not like that. The catheter is smaller. It's ultimately just an easier test. But because you're distending the uterine cavity, you can see those innermost projections. Remember, the uterus is a potential space, meaning it's really collapsed upon itself and those two layers of endometrium touch in its resting state. And that's what, when we look at your uterus and we're measuring the lining, we're really measuring both sides together. And that's that trilaminar aspect. You have the top, where they connect, and the bottom. So when you have a polyp in there, it can sometimes be hard to see, especially depending on what time of the cycle you're looking with vaginal ultrasound, meaning in the luteal phase, once progesterone compacts the lining and you lose that trilaminar appearance and suddenly now everything's homogenous or just kind of solid or grainy looking, it can be really hard to see a polyp. When it's trilaminar and very organized, you often can see a polyp. So I will sometimes tell patients during monitoring, during IVF, when your lining is growing, it's trilaminar getting the thickest that it can, I might see a polyp then. And I might say, hey, you have a uterine polyp. This is going to need to be removed before we do an embryo transfer. And you might skip the saline sonogram or the hysteroscopy step because we did clearly see it and we know it's abnormal. But vaginal sonogram alone cannot catch them all. So saline sonogram, when you push the water in, you are separating these two walls and then you're able to see the inside of the uterine cavity better and you can see these small projections. Now, it's best to do the test when the lining is thin. That means early follicular phase after you're done bleeding, but before you start getting a lining thick enough, typically that stays six to 10 for most people, or when you're on birth control pills. If you do the test in the luteal phase, if you do the test while you're bleeding, you might have a higher incidence of missing a polyp or of diagnosing a blood clot as a polyp. So again, it's a very good test. It's not a perfect test. 
Hysteroscopy is the perfect test. However, hysteroscopy is more painful. It is a thicker gauge. It's a camera that's going through the vagina, through the cervix, and looking inside the uterus. Some clinics do hysteroscopy in the office. Some only do it in the operating room. Some do both. In-office hysteroscopy can totally differ. Sometimes it's only diagnostic, meaning they can put the camera in and look, but all they can say is, oh, you have a polyp. And sometimes it can be diagnostic and therapeutic, meaning you put a camera in, you see a polyp, and you can grab it with a tiny little grasper or a tiny little scissor and take it out. It depends on the setup. So to make it less painful, the camera will be thinner if they do it in your clinic without anesthesia, but it might be so thin that they can't pass the tools through, and then you have to do it again if you actually have a polyp. I personally have never done a polypectomy or a hysteroscopy without anesthesia. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just not how my clinics have ever been set up. So if your clinic says, oh, we have in-office hysteroscopy, and this is the gold standard, they're not lying. A camera you can see exactly what is happening. Fantastic. But you do want to ask, is it done under anesthesia? Can you treat if you see it at the same time? Just know what to expect. That is my only thought. The best way to remove a polyp if you are an infertility patient or trying to get pregnant is definitely hysteroscopy. As we said, camera in the uterus, directed, see the polyp, grab it. Occasionally, you can do blind curettage, which is where you put a curette in and you just scrape. That sometimes is needed if somebody has a plethora of polyps, if you think it's cancerous, if you need to get all the cells. But blind curettage can miss about 10% of polyps. So certainly... If you're in this infertility category, you're having a difficult time getting pregnant or you're paying for fertility treatments, 10% is too much to risk. So you want to have a hysteroscopy, not just a blind polypectomy. And if for some reason you do have a curettage, you want to have a saline afterward or some imaging to make sure everything is actually removed and everything looks good prior to getting to the next step. A number of publications have indicated that removing polyps is beneficial for getting pregnant, whether it's natural pregnancy rates, increase in the group that has polyps after you remove them, IUI, pregnancy rates increase in the group that has polyps after you remove them, and IVF. Specifically looking at IVF, studies have shown that there's no difference in when the polyp is removed, meaning if the polyp is there during the stimulation cycle and then removed prior to the transfer, there's no difference in pregnancy rates. So you can diagnose a polyp Go ahead and proceed with retrieving your eggs and making your embryos and then take the polyp out before you do the transfer. That's my preference because I sometimes see that IVF and the estrogen production can potentially stimulate polyp growth. There was a study that looked at IVF patients. It was small. There were less than 50 patients in each group and it looked at polyps less than 1.5 centimeters in size. And this study was looking at seeing if taking that polyp out improved pregnancy or implantation rates. Notably, this was back in the time of a first transfer. So it is a little bit of an older study and not really how we practice now. But what they were looking at is do you take the polyp out before the stimulation? Do you leave it in place? And this study suggested that if you had a polyp detected and taken out before your cycle, you had the same rate of pregnancy as patients with no polyps. And it does propose that for polyps diagnosed during the IVF cycle, If you were planning a fresh transfer and the polyp was small, less than 1.4 centimeters in size, you didn't have to remove it. It didn't show a difference. Honestly, that doesn't really reflect current practices. And because some of the natural pregnancy studies I said earlier showed that the polyps might prevent pregnancy regardless of size or location, I think it's safest to remove a polyp. I believe in this study, they were trying to avoid canceling somebody's transfer back in the time period where we didn't have as good a freezing technology. But now that we do, I wouldn't feel comfortable proceeding with a transfer in the face of a polyp that I can see of any size. So my take home message is if you find a polyp, I would want it removed. One time in my entire career, have I had somebody who had a single polyp with no other risk factors for endometrial cancer and it did come back cancerous. One patient is too many. If you find a polyp, personally, I want it out. I'm always looking for one before a transfer because you've gone through so much to get to this stage. All right, switching gears for a moment to fibroids. So fibroids are different, also known as uterine leiomyomas, but essentially it is a benign, smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. 
The easiest way to think about it is that it is the same type of tissue as that muscular component of the uterus, the myometrium, but it is in a ball, like a tumor. So it is an abnormal ball accumulation of smooth muscle and fibroids can be in different places. They can be different sizes. Some people have no symptoms. Some people have terrible symptoms. So fibroids are very heterogeneous in how they present. Fibroids do not cause irregular periods. They might cause some intermenstrual spotting like polyps if they are on the inside of the uterus, but the classic fibroid symptoms are heavy bleeding and painful periods. Depending on their size, they might also press, they might cause pelvic pressure, low back pain, pain with intercourse, pain on your bladder. They might cause it to be hard for you to go to the bathroom or be constipated. And then we are always concerned about can they cause infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, or pregnancy outcomes that could be problematic. When you think about a fibroid, the basic types is you can have a fibroid inside the uterine cavity and that is called submucosal and that is a fibroid that is protruding either completely or partially into that uterine cavity. You can then have a fibroid that is intramural and this is going to be most of them and this is in the muscular component of the uterus and then you have subserosal that are actually on the outside of the uterus protruding into the abdominal cavity, and they can even be pedunculated on a small little stalk. Both the size and more importantly, the location of the fibroid is likely what is most important if the fibroid is contributing to infertility. Fibroids are not a common cause of infertility. They are the sole cause for infertility in two to three percent of people. So that is not a huge cause of infertility. The general rule of thumb or how we think about them. Fibroids on the outside, those pedunculated or subserosal fibroids, do not impact infertility. They are not impacting anything. Fibroids on the inside, submucosal fibroids, regardless of size, if it is protruding into the uterine cavity, it is going to have a negative impact on pregnancy rates or implantation rates. If it's an intramural fibroid, it depends. If it is distorting that endometrial cavity, protruding into it, it is more likely to have an impact than if it is just living out in the myometrium. There has been concern that intramural fibroids that are very large might disrupt the blood supply and potentially large intramural fibroids, even if they do not impact the mucosal layer or distort the endometrial cavity, may impact infertility, but removing a fibroid is distorting the blood supply of the uterus as well. So I'll get to it, but our thought has changed on this over time. The mechanism on how fibroids may impact implantation is likely due to changing the uterine contractility, the blood supply, how a placenta can vascularize, but also chronic inflammation. So you always hear that inflammatory component, the body reacting to something that is abnormal, is a huge player in infertility, and especially with implantation. Fibroids are ultimately easier to diagnose. You can see them on classic transvaginal ultrasound, which is usually a part of the diagnostic algorithm if you have an infertility visit at all, or if you're having pain, heavy bleeding, you'll probably have a vaginal ultrasound ordered. So they're pretty easy to see. If it's an intramural fibroid, we may not be able to know if it impacts that cavity without doing some of the tests we said before, like a saline sonogram or some other type of imaging like a hysteroscopy, an HSG. If you're really uncertain, sometimes MRI can be helpful, especially if you can't distinguish a fibroid from adenomyosis. But when it comes to fibroids, removing them also depends on where they're located. So are you going to remove it hysteroscopically like you do a polyp? Yes, if it's inside the cavity. Or are you going to remove it abdominally? And this can be an open incision like a C-section. It can be robotic. It can be laparoscopic. And There are complications or risks with removal, especially the bigger the fibroid gets, the bigger the cut is. You can have complications even afterward, and the one that everybody is always concerned about because it can be just catastrophic is going to be uterine rupture or where the scar is doesn't hold once you go and have a pregnancy. And if that uterus starts contracting, you could have uterine rupture. So 
It is not common, happens about 1% of the time, but it is very scary. And this is why if you have a uterine fibroid removed, depending on how it is repaired, if it's intramural, you might be told you now have to have a C-section because we do not want your uterus contracting because of this risk, because a uterine rupture can immediately decrease the blood supply to the baby. It can cause fetal death. It can cause rapid blood loss to the mom. And if you're not in a hospital setting, can cause death to mom as well. So 1% not common, catastrophic. And so we take it very seriously. All right. So what do you do? Do you take fibroids out or not? The clinical recommendation is that if you have a submucosal fibroid inside the cavity, then you should take it out. On the opposite end, subserosal fibroids, those on the outside, didn't appear to change fertility outcomes, so removing them didn't make any difference to fertility. I'm going to take a moment and just say, fibroids can really impact your life, cause heavy bleeding, pain, anemia, blood transfusion. They can distort your anatomy. You can look pregnant. There's reasons to remove things that are not fertility, and I'm focusing right now on does removal benefit you from a fertility standpoint. And then when it comes to intramural fibroids, if it distorts the cavity, the recommendation is to take it out. But if it does not, what should you do? Previously, we recommended that if the fibroid was large, bigger than five centimeters in diameter, that it should be removed, even if it was intramural and did not distort the cavity. However, the study that came out is over 20 years old. And so I will be honest, most of us now, at least myself, I guess I can talk about me. I have really shifted to more conservatively, not taking out fibroids that are of any size intramural if they do not distort the uterine cavity unless there is an associated negative OB outcome. History of, you know, early preterm birth, pregnancy loss, recurrent miscarriage, because otherwise the risk of distorting the uterine cavity, having scar tissue inside, a major complication, uterine rupture might not be worth it. And I've done many, many embryo transfers. I will even tell you one of my closest friends has a fibroid larger than five centimeters intramurally and I took care of her and she has two babies and we totally left it alone. So it probably does depend on where it is, but with Without having history of loss and without distorting the cavity, it might be better to leave it in place. This is a really good time to have an honest discussion with your doctor. All right. Well, I hope this episode helped you understand a little bit more about inside the uterus, polyps and fibroids, two of the most common things that we find and when they should be evaluated and when they should be removed. The uterus, I always tell patients, you only have one. And once it develops scar, once you have Asherman's, once something goes wrong, it can be really hard to get it back to normal. So I am very conservative when it comes to protecting your uterus and making sure that we are making good decisions when it comes to your story. A lot of your care should be personalized. And I think that is the key. I can't say I would do the same thing for a fibroid of five centimeters in every person. It depends on where it is, your history, how it looks, how the cavity is, and a variety of other factors probably unique to you. So this is why finding a doctor who will explain things to you, takes the time to do the evaluation, and really helps you have shared decision-making in your care is so important. All right, we are going to end with For Fertility's Sake. This is our weekly Q&A segment where I answer your top fertility questions. These are questions that you ask on Instagram every week at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can call and leave a voicemail for our favorite voicemail episodes, 657-229-3672. Again, that is 657-229-3672. All right. What is the normal prep for hysteroscopy? This is a really good question because we did talk about hysteroscopy a lot in this episode. Hysteroscopy again is surgery. It can be done in office or in anesthesia. So understanding where it's happening, are you having anesthesia and is it just diagnostic, just putting the camera in and looking or can they treat what they find? In general, hysteroscopy in well-trained hands is very low risk. However, there are a couple of risks that should be talked about. One is uterine perforation. This is poking a hole in the top of the uterus. This happens more when somebody dilates the cervix. So they're putting dilators through, or if they're untrained, if you have uterine scar, maybe a bad endometriosis and your uterus is scarred in an abnormal direction, or if you have uterine scar inside the uterus, 
like Asherman syndrome where the cavity is distorted and you may not see the boundaries very well. I like to give a, what we consider cervical ripening agent before hysteroscopy. So mesoprostol. You've probably heard of meso because it's gotten a lot of attention being one of the medications that can be used in therapeutic or medical abortion, but in can also be used for cervical ripening for labor. And I like it because it is going to soften the cervix and help open it up because I almost never dilate the cervix. I can just place a small camera through the cervix easy peasy and the majority of patients. Also, the more hysteroscopy somebody does, the better. REIs in general do a lot of hysteroscopy. We really specialize in it versus other things. For example, now I don't do laparoscopy anymore. I did for many years, but I do tons of hysteroscopy complex, septum resections, Asherman's, polyps, fibroids, all of that. So Your OB very well may be excellently trained. So it's just a question of understanding the surgery. The basic prep will be not to eat anything the night before. You may or may not be on birth control pills because the timing of the surgery, having a thin lining can be helpful. I always explain it like a polyp. Imagine I have a tree stump in the yard and I want to go take it out. If the grass is really high, I may not be able to get the tree stump all the way out. But if the yard is freshly mowed, I can see very clearly where the tree stump is. So having freshly mowed grass or a thin lining is really helpful for surgery. It also decreases some of the other complications, which can be cutting a hole in the top of the uterus, that perforation, or fluid deficit water overload because the water you put inside the uterus with hysteroscopy, you put that camera in and you distend the uterine cavity with water, which allows you to operate and to see. That water can get absorbed into the bloodstream. It can also make the uterine cavity harder to see. And in some cases, especially long surgery, You may have to stop the surgery before completion because somebody's body is absorbing too much water. That happens much more likely in like a fibroid resection that's very large where you're having an increase of a connection into the blood supply versus something like a polyp or a septum. And then afterward, I know this question was prep, but so you'll be NPO, you want to know where the surgery is going to happen, you might be on birth control pills or have it planned at a certain time in your cycle, you might get a cervical ripening agent. Afterward, you do want to know the post-op plan, and this is what most patients aren't aware of. It depends on what we find, at least for me. Most of the time, if it's diagnostic or you have a polyp, nothing. You'll just rest that day and then we'll be ready to go into your treatment pretty quickly. You will have some restrictions afterward for most people for swimming and intercourse and baths just because we don't want to risk getting an infection. And then if you had extensive uterine surgery, so a very large fibroid removal, something that distorted the cavity, Asherman's, or a large septum, I like to put a uterine balloon inside the uterus and do hormonal treatment to try to decrease the chance of an infection. That's about a month of a recovery period, and you just want to know what to expect. Do you recommend estrogen priming for patients with a low AMH? This is an IVF question, so if you're not aware, estrogen priming is a type of IVF protocol, and low AMH is having low egg count. You have a low egg yield. When you have a lower egg count, your ovaries tend to be more stubborn. So remember that the ovary wants to ovulate just one egg every month, no matter how many eggs are available. If you have fewer eggs remaining and a lower AMH, you have fewer eggs available each month. And if you have fewer eggs, the body is going to resist what we're trying to do with IVF, which is get more than one egg to grow. Estrogen priming does help for certain patients. It is not my favorite protocol for a low AMH for a variety of different reasons, but I just do not think that it performs as well for most people. But Protocols are personal, and so it does take some time to figure out what might work for the right person. I'm not saying this one is wrong. I just tend to see that it doesn't achieve the goal of getting a synchronous cohort in the majority of people. Is having a long follicular phase, 24 to 26 days, bad? Well, yes and no. It can definitely be within the realm of normal. So if you say, hey, my periods come every 35 days, 
then I would actually anticipate that you're ovulating closer to day 21 or 22 of your cycle. So you do have a long follicular phase. However, we also see this sometimes in patients who are at the starting stage of an ovulatory dysfunction. Maybe there's a thyroid or a prolactin abnormality. Maybe there's some PCOS involved. And having that longer follicular phase certainly can mean you have less opportunities to get pregnant because your cycle is longer. If your periods are very regular, it just might be on the realm of normal. But this is a circumstance where I would make sure there's no underlying endocrine abnormality And then I would consider ovulation induction to see if we can normalize it, just to see if we can improve the efficacy of you getting pregnant. Your chance of pregnancy, even though we casually say per month, is per cycle. So if your periods are every 40 days apart, you have fewer cycles or opportunities to get pregnant than somebody who are 27 days apart. And that does mean it will take you longer on average to get pregnant. So improving that, shortening that follicular phase can be a strategy. But I will say most of the time, I actually do find that patients with a long follicular phase have something underlying, whether it's PCOS, high prolactin, or thyroid. Is ovulation, spotting, or bleeding a bad sign when trying to conceive? So timely. So It can be normal. It can be not. On principle, is it bad? No, because your hormones are changing. And so it can be common to have this little dip in estrogen and to have a little bit of spotting. That doesn't mean you can't get pregnant. However, it can also be a sign, as we said in this episode, of an intrauterine abnormality, like a polyp or a fibroid inside the uterine cavity. It could also represent some issue with the stability of your uterus or potentially ovulation. In a study I did in natural conception, looking at a population of people who were trying to get pregnant, those people who had any luteal bleeding, which we defined as the day after ovulation to the day before your next period had a decrease, a significant decrease in pregnancy rates. Now, how many of these people might have had polyps or fibroids that were undiagnosed? I don't know, but I would say if you are constantly having bleeding or spotting, I would want to get an evaluation and make sure there's nothing that is going on. If it's a one-off, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but if it happens every single month, I would want to know there's nothing structurally causing that abnormality. All right, guys. Well, I hope this episode helped you learn a little bit about the uterus and a little bit about polyps and fibroids, things that we can commonly find on anatomic evaluation of our fertility patients. As always, I appreciate you so much. You can ask your fertility questions for these episodes every Monday at Natalie Crawford MD on Instagram. You can also call the voicemail at 657-229-3672. Again, 657-229-3672. And you can sign up for the newsletter at nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. Thanks, friends. Thank you all for listening to As a Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman.